A hunting reality lurks within the ferocity of nature's most dangerous and fierce animals. There are predators in the wild who are capable of taking down even the strongest people. However, most predators prefer an easy target, one they can take down without too much of a fight. Being slower, smaller, and more curious, children have oftentimes fallen victim to one of these beasts. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are three of the worst animal attacks on children covered on the channel so far. Welcome to Final Affliction. Prospect Park Zoo in Brooklyn was once on the list for the top 10 worst zoos in America. The animals were kept in small cages or in pit-style enclosures. They were offered little stimulation or environmental enrichment, but provided entertainment for the thousands of visitors that had entered its gates since the 1930s. In May 1987, just as the zoo closed up for the day, three young boys walked around its perimeter. They were on a mission, a mischievous mission that was both exciting and adventurous, but it was also dangerous. They planned to sneak into the zoo and swim around the seal moat. It was a silly dare the 10 and 11-year-olds had come up with, though it would be one that would cost one of them his life. The security team began their patrol, and the night watchman on duty paced near the zoo's entrance. But the boys had found another way in. A small hole in the perimeter fencing was just big enough for the youngsters to crawl through. They knelt down, hardly daring to breathe as they tugged at the fencing a little. Then they pulled themselves through on their tummies and stepped inside. All was quiet. A few workers remained on site, but the hustle and bustle from the visiting public had died down now. The boys made their way to the seal enclosure, but on the way, they spotted something else. Another enclosure, the polar bear exhibit. This also had a moat around it, but this one was far more dangerous. It was far more exciting for the three young boys. They dared each other to climb in and swim around the polar bear's moat. It was the ultimate challenge. The night watchman and security team were on the lookout that night, as they were every night. They had driven past the polar bear enclosure at 5.15 that evening and again at 5.45. They were due back there two hours later as they patrolled the park. They were aware of break-ins during out-of-hours and often had to chase youngsters out of the park at night. So far, none had been stupid enough to breach any of the animal enclosure fences, but that was about to change. These three boys were up for the polar bear challenge, and each agreed to it. They stripped their clothes off, removing their trousers and shoes, ready for their daring swim. All three of them were giggling with excitement. They couldn't see the polar bears at the time, as they were in their cave, but they knew they were in there. They just needed to scale the wrought iron fence and drop down on the other side. Then they needed to swim around the moat before climbing back out. That was the plan. It would be an excellent story to tell their friends. To have swum in the polar bear enclosure was only for the bravest of boys. Eleven-year-old Juan picked up all their clothes and threw them into the enclosure. There was no going back now. He began to climb the metal fence. He pulled himself upwards, scraping his hands on the bars. At the top, he managed to climb up and over the outwards pointing sharp metal points. He teetered on the top of the fence, waiting for his friends to catch him up. One of them backed down and remained on the ground, but the other scaled the fence with Juan. They looked down into the enclosure below. It was surrounded on three sides by the moat, had eight-foot iron fences around it, and was backed by a twenty-foot cliff. The boy's clothes lay in a pile on the concrete. Juan dropped down, closely followed by his other friend. They were inside. They had made it. Now, the real challenge began. The dare was to swim in the moat. The two boys walked forwards whilst their friend watched on the other side of the bars. Juan stepped into the moat, but his friend decided against it. It was too dangerous. He headed back to the fence, while Juan proceeded through the water. He half waded, half swam across to the other side. The water was cold. A shudder ran down his spine. 
By now, the commotion the boys had created had alerted the enclosure's residents. 1,200-pound, 540-kilogram Teddy and 900-pound, 400-kilogram Lucy, the bears stirred from their den and came outside to investigate. They lifted their heads upwards and sniffed the air. Then they turned and looked at the boys. They had been at the zoo for more than 20 years, born in 1964 and transferred to the zoo the following year. That enclosure was all they had known. They had never encountered anyone else or anything else in their territory before, so this had come as a shock. How were they going to react in this new situation? Would their natural instincts kick in? By now, Juan had swum across the moat to the other side. He had climbed out, and when he stood up, dripping wet, he saw the enormous polar bears. The first bear did nothing. It just stood, staring at the boy. But the other polar bear reacted differently. Upon spotting the intruder, the male polar bear immediately clambered down a rocky outcrop towards the boy. It lumbered towards him with the characteristic gait of a polar bear, its head swinging slightly from side to side, its huge paws placed carefully in front of it with each step, an impressive beast, powerful and strong. Juan felt the adrenaline surging through his veins, his heart thumped loudly in his ears. He felt sheer terror as the enormous predator came closer and closer. He froze, visibly shaking where he stood. He didn't try to run. He didn't try to hide. Instead, the small 11-year-old froze to the spot as the polar bear lunged at him. It grabbed him in its jaws and shook him violently. His friends screamed as they watched on in horror. The boy's cries were heard by staff at the zoo. They knew something terrible must have happened. Children had been sneaking into the zoo recently, and the security guards were constantly patrolling the zoo at night. It was now 7 p.m., two hours since the zoo had closed, and the blood-curdling screams meant only one thing, that someone was in serious trouble. They followed the sound of the desperate cries and dialed 911. As their friend was being mauled to death, the other two boys made a run for it, two partially naked boys fleeing into the night. When the zoo staff arrived at the polar bear exhibit, they could see the male polar bear dragging Juan's body across the enclosure. The boy was limp and lifeless. Emergency services and armed officers arrived on scene. What they found was deeply disturbing. There, just outside the polar bear den, were the two polar bears. Both were growling and fighting over the remains of the boy, tussling over the body. Only his upper half was left and they pulled at it, each trying to keep it for themselves. It was a gruesome sight. There was no hope for the boy. It was clear to the officers that he was dead. They saw the pile of clothes scattered about on the ground and the blood on the polar bear's white fur. The scene they were faced with was deeply concerning. They suspected that there might be other children inside the enclosure. They found three pairs of trousers, a pair of trainers, and two unmatched shoes inside the compound. They thought more children might be hiding inside the cave, and so made the decision to shoot the bears. It took 20 blasts from 12-gauge shotguns firing rifled slugs and six bullets from a 38 caliber revolver to kill the bears. Finally, they fell to the ground, quiet and still. It was a sad end to their tragic lives. Protests broke out over the killing of the bears, and the zoo came under fire as it had done so many times before, for its lack of welfare towards the animals in its care. That very same evening, at 11 p.m., an autopsy was performed on the bears. Officers and zoo staff wanted to make sure that they had only killed one child and not any more. They didn't yet understand the whole story. When they cut the bears open, they found the remains of Juan and no one else. When the bears were dead, they scoured the enclosure to check for more bodies, just to make sure no more were found. Later, the parents of Juan's two friends called police to inform them what had happened. That's when the two boys were interviewed and were able to reveal the true horror of the story, a silly dare that went horribly, horribly wrong. Prospect Park Zoo was closed to the public a year later, in 1988. The cages and pit enclosures were completely demolished, along with most of the interior buildings. The zoo had long needed an overhaul. The conditions the animals had been kept in for more than 50 years 
were appalling. Empty beer cans and smashed wine bottles were strewn about some of the enclosures. The animals were injured by their inadequate housing. There were reports of staff mistreating and even killing some of the animals. And now, finally, something was being done about it. During the renovation works, the animals were rehoused across America. Then, five years and $37 million later, the newly named Prospect Park Wildlife Conservation Center reopened. It was the fresh start the zoo needed. The conditions the animals were kept in were greatly improved, and the center had a new focus to educate young people about wildlife and its conservation. A positive ending to an otherwise horrible story. Juan and two polar bears meeting their preventable final affliction. Many different things can trigger a shark attack, although some are less well-known than others. We're all familiar with the stories of surfers being attacked because they look like seals from below. And we know that a splashing motion can attract sharks, thinking it's a struggling or injured animal. Aside from the obvious, there's new research that is still taking place to suggest some other triggers for shark attacks, such as blood in the water, or more strangely, human urine. This may explain why seven-year-old Alicia Webster was attacked while swimming in New Zealand. The event has certainly sparked some controversy regarding why some sharks attack humans. New Zealand is not exactly famed for its shark attacks, with the country having a low occurrence rate and only a couple of reports annually. That being said, there are over 70 shark species that inhabit their waters, including the infamously dangerous Great White Shark, which may convince some people to stay out of the water altogether. For others, the ocean offers an escape. Sailors in particular love to make the most of their time on the open ocean. The Webster family were avid sailors who, in 2005, decided to take their yacht to Malakula so that they could have some time away from home on the boat. They shared the yacht with the Morcom family, who they had a common love for sailing with. They had borrowed each other's boats in the past, but recently had decided that they should simply share a boat, and then they could also go on holiday together. This trip, however, was just for family, so Alicia was going to spend as much time with her parents, siblings, and grandparents as possible. As the family arrived at Malakula with their yacht, they were immediately disappointed by the weather, which was particularly cloudy and gave the island a gloomy look. They landed on the shore and were immediately greeted by Le Pen Tillison, who was a teacher living on the island. He saw Alicia swimming in the water and warned the family that they shouldn't allow their daughter to swim in the ocean as it was a popular area for sharks. He explained that many fishing boats regularly came to stop in this area which attracted the attention of sharks who wanted an easy meal. As a result, he never let his children swim in the sea. There were various freshwater places nearby that would be much safer and so Le Pen suggested that the family move away from the beach in search of these areas. They agreed that they would want to keep their daughter safe and so moved inland to have lunch away from the water's edge. However, once they were finished eating, the family returned to the water despite the warnings. Le Pen came back to the family to warn them once again of the dangers that the sharks would pose to them. They told Alicia to get out of the water again, but this time seemed annoyed with Le Pen's interruptions and hoped that they would be left alone if they complied with his warnings. Satisfied that they understood the dangers, Le Pen returned to his home and continued with his day leaving the family to relax on the beach. However, the family would soon make a devastating mistake, which would cost little Alicia her life. After Le Pen was out of sight, Grant and Cherie Webster told their daughter that she could return to the water, as they were convinced that Le Pen was exaggerating. There were plenty of other local children that were playing in the water, so why should their daughter be excluded after they sailed all the way here? They sat on the shore as they watched their daughter paddle in the shallows, happy that they had raised such a water-confident child. She loudly announced to them that she needed to pee, and they assured her that it was okay if she peed in the ocean. That's where it would end up eventually anyways. They kept an eye on her, but trusted that she was fine. She was used to the water after all, 
They were more preoccupied with the local children, who looked a bit scared about something. While quickly trying to get out of the water, the parents watched them with interest, but when they turned back to Alicia, she was nowhere to be seen. How was that possible? They had only looked away for a second, and she was only a few meters into the water, barely deep enough to reach her stomach. As they scanned the water for any sign of her, she burst through the water and back to the surface screaming. Alicia's father, Grant, leapt into action and sprinted towards his screaming daughter. He pulled her out of the water and laid her on the sand, desperately trying to stop the blood that was pouring from her leg. Everyone was panicking. The children were running from the water in fear, trying to escape the blood that was gradually turning the shoreline red. Alicia had been attacked by a shark. That much was clear, but her parents still couldn't figure out the details of the attack. They hadn't even seen the shark that had grabbed her. All that mattered at this point was to try and save their daughter. Her left leg had been completely severed at the thigh, along with several bite wounds across her entire left side. She was bleeding profusely and growing colder with every second, so they knew they didn't have much time. Grant picked her up, and together, the parents used a dinghy from their yacht to take Alicia back to the mainland. Once they arrived at the shore, they flagged down a lorry and begged the driver to take them to a hospital. Upon seeing the pale and motionless child presented to him, the driver took them to the closest hospital, 30 minutes away. Unfortunately, after arriving at the hospital nearly an hour later, Alicia was pronounced dead on arrival. There was nothing to be done. Her family was beside themselves with grief and blamed themselves for not heeding the advice of Le Pen, who told them of the dangers that hid beneath the waves. If only they had listened. After it was announced that the child had died, the locals were heartbroken. They tried to identify the shark that was responsible for the attack, but no one had been able to see the attack except Alicia, so there was no way to know the species. In the days following the attack, Local canoeists reported seeing a large tiger shark patrolling the waters where the girl was attacked, leading many to believe that this was the shark responsible. Although possible, a great white shark was also spotted just two days before the accident, so we will most likely never know. Her body was quickly returned home with her family so that they were able to pay their respects and remember their child as the happy, carefree child that she was, rather than the horrific way in which she died. Despite these details, we still don't know one of the most important details. Why did the mystery shark attack little Alicia to begin with? There is one theory that is widely debated that is relevant to this case in particular. Are sharks attracted to human urine, and could this be a cause for an attack? It is widely explained that while sharks are attracted to the scent of blood in the ocean, they are not as interested in urine, as it doesn't indicate that someone is injured in the same way that blood would. That being said, sharks have a highly developed sense that they use to hunt, meaning that they are high-tuned to any and all bodily fluids that may enter the water. So by urinating in the ocean, Alicia may have alerted the shark that killed her of her presence in the water, which led it to coming to investigate. Other swimmers reported feeling the shark pass below them without attacking them, so it is strange that the animal seemingly beelined to Alicia. If it was just hunting, then it would have attacked the children in the deeper water, as it would have been able to easily overpower them and drag them underwater while it waited for them to drown. Instead, it chose a small girl who was near the shoreline, where it would be a less effective hunter and risk beaching itself. As a result, this had led some to speculate that this shark was attracted to her urine in the water, although these claims are not backed up by scientific theory. Some would argue that urine would actually dissuade a shark from attacking as it would interfere with its ability to smell blood, its main target. However, the attack on Alicia begs to differ, and her death serves to remind people of the mystery of shark behavior. Next time you swim off to pee in the ocean, you may be unknowingly attracting your final affliction. At just eight years old, Jeremy Williams attended his local Cayucat Elementary School, along with his four-year-old brother, Daniel. They were members of the native Cayucat people. 
Their father also taught at the school in the isolated community on British Columbia's Vancouver Island. Belonging to a community steeped in tradition and rich in culture, Jeremy and Daniel were two of the 300 First Nation people living in the village. Their rural, isolated community was situated 140 miles northwest of Victoria, surrounded by beautiful wilderness. Cayucat is the most northwesterly contemporary settlement of the Nootka-speaking natives. It is a fishing village. The food of the ocean has provided for the community for generations. The First Nations people came there over 4,000 years ago. They were drawn by the rich sea life, natural resources, mild climate, and the beautiful surroundings. But in those surroundings were hidden dangers. Wild animals lurked. Most turned away at the first sight of a human, but for others, they were bold and brazen. They posed a real risk, especially to those who wandered off alone. The close proximity of the school to the wilderness was a concern for parents. They had repeatedly asked school governors to erect a fence around the school and its grounds. They knew that wild animals were common in the area, and they believed that it was only a matter of time before an attack on the school children. Sadly, they were right. During the recent weeks, there had been more and more cougar sightings on Vancouver Island. The cats were naturally curious animals, and some had little fear of humans. They approached walkers, cyclists, and even wildlife rangers. The advice was always to stand still, wave your arms above your head, and shout. Never turn your back on a cougar and try and throw something at it. Any small children should be picked up. Typically, they will run away. Usually, they are just interested in something you're carrying rather than you, such as food in your backpack. But if they see you as the prey, then that is a whole different story. A mountain lion that is stalking you is not merely curious, they want a meal. On a Tuesday morning in May 1992, Jeremy was playing with his brother Daniel and their two friends in the school playground. Their father, who was one of the teachers at the school, was inside the building. He could hear the children playing and would sometimes look out through the windows and catch his two boys running around with the others. But he wasn't the only one watching the children playing that morning. A cougar had been drawn to the shrieks and cries of the young children as they played outside during recess. Jeremy sat down on a grassy bank on the edge of the playground, whilst the other children continued to run around behind him. He looked out at the surrounding woodland, but he failed to spot the camouflaged cat in the undergrowth. The cougar locked its eyes onto the small boy. It was a female, just a yearling. She was likely hunting on her own for one of the first times. Mountain lions typically remain with their mothers until between the ages of 14 to 21 months. As a yearling, she can't have been independent for very long. She was an inexperienced hunter, but an opportunistic one, one of the most dangerous of her kind. Cougars are hypercarnivores, meaning that they only eat meat. In Yellowstone National Park, they compete with wolves for elk and deer. Elsewhere, they also hunt smaller mammals such as raccoons, porcupines, and wild turkeys. But they typically hunt at night or during dusk and dawn. So why was this one out in the day? Perhaps it had had an unsuccessful night on the hunt. Perhaps it was very, very hungry. The cougar crouched down low, her belly inches from the ground. Slowly, she crept forwards in the undergrowth, her footsteps silent on the ground, her eyes unblinking. Then she made a dash for it, suddenly running from the woodland towards the boy. She covered the open ground between Jeremy and herself in a second. A flash of brown caught Jeremy's eye and he looked up and screamed as he saw the 60-pound, 27-kilogram mountain lion launch itself at him. He didn't have time to get up and run. It jumped on top of him, instinctively going for the neck. Her claws dug into his body, and the long canines pierced his throat as it mauled him. The other children screamed and all made a run for the school building. Some rushed inside, shouting for help. They knew their friend was in serious trouble. It was pandemonium. Jeremy was trying to fight back, but he was too small in comparison to the wild cat. He didn't stand a chance. The weight of her body pinned him down, and when she closed her jaws around his throat, he had just seconds to live. Kevin Williams, Jeremy's father, 
heard the chaos outside and ran to the playground. There, he saw his eldest son underneath the beige-brown cat, his head in its jaws. He ran at the mountain lion, yelling and shouting, trying desperately to distract it and scare it away. He tried to find something to throw at it as he rushed forwards, but time was running out. Although only seconds passed in reality, time seemed to stand still. The attack seemed to go on forever, with Kevin feeling powerless to stop it. Then the school janitor, also hearing the terrified screams of the school children, came running outside with his rifle. He lifted it, took aim, and fired a single shot. The cougar collapsed on the ground next to the youngster, but it was too late. It had already delivered its fatal bite. There was nothing Kevin could do for his son. He held the boy limp in his arms whilst his four-year-old son, Daniel, Jeremy's younger brother, watched on. The death of one of their own shook the close-knit Cayucat community. It was a tragedy that could so easily have been avoided. Richard Leo, a Cayucat Indian chief, told the authorities that parents were furious at the school board for not protecting the children from the threat of wild animals. There weren't just cougars out there, there were bears and wolves. Richard said that no pupils would be returning to the school until they had assurances that a fence will be erected around its grounds. Being surrounded by prime cougar and bear habitat, their children needed to be kept safe. A dozen children were in the playground that day. They witnessed one of their friends being killed right before their eyes. And for Daniel, he had watched in horror as his older brother was mauled just feet from where he stood. Professional counseling was provided for those children and there was an outpouring of support from the local community. It was a tragedy that will never be forgotten by those in Cayucat. There are some 4,000 cougars in the whole of Canada, 3,500 of which are found in British Columbia. Vancouver Island has the highest concentration of cougars in the world, with around 800 calling the island home. In the past 100 years, five people have lost their lives to the mountain lions in British Columbia. Surprisingly, all but one of these occurred on Vancouver Island. During the same period, 29 non-fatal attacks occurred in British Columbia, 20 of which were on the island. The majority of these were on children under the age of 16. Although these attacks are devastating for all involved, they are actually exceedingly rare. But it is the elusiveness of the cougars that makes them so terrifying, knowing that they are out there and that they are born predators with the ability to take down a 600-pound moose. Most Canadians will never see one, but for those that do, it often comes along with their terrifying final affliction.